All right. So everybody should be seeing the neonscience.org homepage. Um, and there's one thing that I want to point out to you guys on this homepage, um, if you plan on using the data portal, um, that I think will be useful for you. There's this strip across here that's labeled the latest from NEON. The top one talks about updates and links to updates and changes to our data portal, talks about um, data releases, um, as well as updates to um, major packages like NEON utilities, which we will be going over and using during this workshop. The bottom one talks about our observatory status page. This is a website for up-to-date information about our actions in response to COVID-19 and natural disasters, um, including um, field site closures and reopenings. And we do have some sites that are um, subject to um, tropical storms, um, particularly um, our sites in Puerto Rico. So we have had closures associated with that. If you go to that page, it's gonna give you all the information you're gonna need on our response to COVID-19 uh, and on all of the different um, sites and domains that are either open or closed. So you can see um, status as of June 14th, which ones are open. Um, also something else on this page that's pretty important is this link right here. The one that says COVID-19 impacts on 2020 NEON data collection and data products. If you plan on using our data from 2020, it's likely that it was probably impacted by COVID-19. Um, and so if you're noticing a gap in the data, I would definitely check out this link to see whether or not um, COVID-19 did in fact cause that gap. Okay. So let's go back to the homepage. So now I'm gonna take you through a few of these headers um, before I get to the data portal, because I think a lot of them are super useful. Um, first, we'll start in about us. So this overview tab, if you need to learn more about um, NEON and the history and the design and management of NEON, this is the place to go. Um, but I think this advisory groups tab, um, is going to be of more interest to you guys. So we have two different types of advisory group. The advisory groups. The first I'm going to cover is the Science, Technology, and Education Advisory Committee. So this is made up of experts um, in ecology in multiple fields that are external to Neon, and um, they advise um, Battelle, um, which manages Neon. Um, and NEON program staff on the planning and operation of NEON um, in general and gives us strategic guidance um, associated with um, how we can succeed and how we can prioritize our activities. So if you are a NEON super user and you're super invested in NEON, um, I recommend um, checking this out and learning more about this advisory group. Um, the other advisory groups group we have are our technical working groups. So these are made up of primarily external experts, um, but also some NEON staff. Um, and they advise us on a variety of things, um, in particular data collection and processing methods and um, NEON infrastructure. So um, we have technical working groups on um, specific data products like FISH, um, but we also have technical working groups on community engagement. So I help lead the community engagement one and we talk about how we can better engage um, with the community. And it's really useful to have um, external advice um, from folks outside of NEON. So if you're interested in advising NEON and you're an expert in a particular data product, um, I would check this out. The last thing I wanna point out in About Us is this Contact Us page. If you scroll down here, we have this Contact Us form. And this is not just any ordinary form. When you fill this out, it actually generates a service ticket and it's sent to an, a NEON team and then a specific NEON scientist to answer your question. So if you have a question about NEON, you can always reach out to Claire and I, but I think um, this form will get you to the correct person right away in a more efficient manner. Um, and what you can put in this form, you can do anything from, hey, I'd like to do a site visit or do some type of engagement activity to you with you to I have this very specific question about um, a line of code in this tutorial and it will get to the correct person. So I highly recommend using this form if you have questions. So I'm going to skip beyond the data and samples pit tab because we're going to go to that when we go over the data portal. But I want to point out this 
field sites tab, we have this really great explore field sites page. Um, and within it, we have this pretty cool map view where if you zoom in, you can see all oops, that was zooming out all of our different field sites across the United States. And if you click on an icon, so let's click on um, Poom, which is our site in Hawaii. Um, you can learn a little bit more about the site and if you hit the site details, it's going to take you to that specific site page. Um, you can also search for a site in table view. So I'm going to search for that site code and it's going to come up right here. The other thing I want to point out on this page is this download, download field site table CSV. So if you download this, it's going to go into um, you know, your spreadsheet environment, likely Microsoft Excel for y'all. And it's going to cover all of the metadata for all of our field sites in one place. It's a really great snapshot. Um, it also has information in it on um, permitting and how to access our field sites. So if you want to learn about all of our field sites in one snapshot, this is this is the spreadsheet to download. OK, so. I am not going to cover impact resources or get involved because I'm going to be talking about those on Thursday during my educational resources talk on how to bring um, NEON into your classroom. Um, but I do want to point out that under this resources tab, we have a learning hub and we have tutorials. And through the course of this workshop, we're going to be working with a lot of different tutorials. Um, is particularly for all those breakout sessions. So just want to let you know that they are within this tab resources and within Learning Hub, and they are a wonderful resource that I'm excited to work with with you guys. All right. So now let's get into a little bit more on the data. Let me X out of this. So if we go to the data and samples tab, you can see the data portals up here and I'll get to that in a minute, I promise. But first I wanna cover some other really um, great web pages associated with our data portal. And I wanna point out that a lot of these links to web pages are actually within the data portal as well. Um, this is just another way to navigate to them. So first, I want to take you to the samples and specimens page. So um, if you were able to come to our introductory webinar on NEON, you would know that not only do we have a data portal with over 180 data products, um, but we also have a biorepository. So we archive um, biological, genomic, and geological samples and specimens um, from our terrestrial and aquatic sites. And many of them are stored at the NEON Biorepository, which is managed by Arizona State University. And so this webpage will tell you kind of how to find them, all the different samples we have. It'll um, tell you how to request excess samples. But I think if you're gonna remember anything from this webpage, it's this biorepository link. So if you click on it, it's gonna take you to the biorepository data portal, um, which is kind of similar to our, um, the NEON data portal, only this is focused solely on samples and specimens. And you can use this portal to search for samples and specimens. I just wanna point out that we have over 103,000 samples from over 700 taxa. So there's so much for you guys to look at and explore here. Um, and if you're curious about it, we have the contact information you need. You can always contact Claire and myself as well. All right. Um, I'll, I'll just jump in for a second and also say um, those of you who uh, are signed up for the biorepository breakout session uh, will also hear much more about that at that time. Yes, thank you so much, Claire. Um, I forgot to mention we do have a breakout session coming up. Um, okay, so back to the data and samples page or tab. So I'm not going to go into these pages because we have tons of collection methods pages, but we have kind of website pages on the sampling design and sampling frequency for um, all of our science systems, airborne remote sensing, automated instruments and observation sam and observational sampling as well as very specific pages on our sampling design and um, collection frequency of these kind of broad um, data products. 
Um, I want to point out that we have even more specific information on the data product details page of every specific data product. So if you're looking for more kind of general information on our sampling design and collection frequency, these would be the pages to go to. But if you're looking for the exact methods of how we collect a data for a specific data product, we're going to go to you're going to go to the data product details page, which I will get into because that is within the data portal. Something else under data and samples that's really important um, for you guys to know about is this data policies and citation guidelines page. Um, so first and foremost, it points out that we follow fair data principles, meaning that our data are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But secondly, it, should, it talks about our data usage policy, as well as, and I know I'm kind of scrolling quickly, um, how to acknowledge and cite NEON. It gives you all the information you're going to need for how to cite downloaded data, how to cite um, samples and specimens, all of our documents, our code packages, educational resources. It's got kind of everything there um, to make citing our information as easy as possible. Um, and one thing that we ask is that when you use our data and publish with it, that you cite us. Um, and so more information about that is on this page. So next, I'm gonna go into data management, um, which is gonna be, pretty useful for you guys when you're using um, our data. So first is this data availability page. And so this talks about how quickly new data will be published after it's collected. Um, and it goes over kind of that data latency period for the observational system, the, uh, the instrument system, and the urban remote sensing system. Typically, our data um, from our instrument systems are available quicker than um, like our, our observational or airborne remote sensing systems. Um, and so it just gives you a general overview of the backlog of data and how long it will likely take to be processed for when it's available on our data portal. Back to data management data formats and conventions. So we have a lot of data. Um, and that means that we had to come up with a system to format it and um, to name all of it. Um, and so it, it got pretty complicated. And so this page gives you a general overview of our formats and conventions. It talks about our different file names and um, how we set up our packages. It, it talks about our different abbreviations because we have a lot of abbreviations associated with NEON in general and our data products. Um, for example, we had to have timestamp abbreviations. Um, and so this is a good page to go to if you're curious about kind of all of those conventions and formats in a general manner. Um, you can learn about more specific um, kind of naming conventions within that data product details page. Okay, continuing with data management. I am not going to be talking about data processing because we will have a talk on that by another NEON scientist. However, I just want to point out that it is within this data management tab, also within the data portal. Um, before we get to the data portal, the last thing I'm going to talk about is data quality. So this web page goes over NEON's general data quality program and how we do quality assurance and quality control here at NEON. Um, this is a general overview. If you are interested in specific um, data quality issues for a specific data product. So let's say you notice an outlier in your data um, when you're analyzing it, you're going to want to look at the data product details page and the files within that on our quality flags. This is, would not be the place to go. Um, this is just kind of your general overview of how we do data quality here at NEON. So now that we've kind of run through pretty much everything in data and samples that's not within the data portal, I'm going to head into the data portal. So multiple web pages within here. Um, we're going to go, when we actually want to download and look for data products, we're going to go into this Explore Data Products page. But first, I'm going to point out a few other pages um, that 
are likely going to be really useful to you. So first is the spatial, spatial data and maps page. So we have spatial data layers and maps that are openly available for you to download. These include shape files, KMZ files, and printable maps. The shape files can be open in GIS programs. Um, the KMZ files can be opened directly into Google Earth. Um, all of this data is not in our Explore Data Products page. It's in this separate area because it just didn't fit. So if you're interested in um, Neon Geographic data, this is the page to go to, and I recommend heading here. All right, back to the data, data portal. Um, next, the document library. This is the place to go if you want to find any documentation about NEON. Um, we have some general documentation on um, our science designs and kind of you know how NEON was set up and the history of NEON. We have documentation on our algorithms. We have documentation on site characterization reports, meaning um, how the site was set up right when we got there, um, why we chose that site. Um, we have that spatial data here as well, documentation on that. Um, but there's two types of documentation that I think are probably the most useful to you guys. First, um, the data product user guides, which are all on that data product details page that I keep bringing up that I promise we will get to. Um, and then second, our protocols. So our protocols are essentially um, methods documents for observational system um, data collection. So for our aquatic data collection and our terrestrial data collection. And these are really great if you have you know, worked with the data, you're trying to publish and you're writing up your methods section and you're like, wait, how did they actually collect the data? This, you can use these documents to help you write that section. Um, however, something I want to point out is we revise our protocols, um, and we include all of our past versions on our website. So if you search for a particular protocol, it's going to bring up past versions and newer versions as well. So for example, if I search mammal for our small mammal trapping protocol, we're going to get multiple small mammal trapping protocol documents. We, all, we know it's the same protocol because the number is 00481. Every single document here says 00481. So they're all the protocol for small mammal trapping, but we have different versions indicated by this letter. Um, and so all of these versions are old versions. Um, and so when you are citing NEON and when you are writing your method section, you're gonna wanna use the most new, the newest version and so you're going to look for um, the kind of latest letter in the alphabet, which I think for this one, it is L. OK, hopefully everyone is still with me. We are going to head back to Neon Science and back within this data portal tab. The last thing I'm going to talk about before we really get into exploring data products um, is this API page. So um, API meaning application programming interface. Um, our API can be used to quickly access data as well as um, information about our data product samples and sampling locations. It's a great efficient way to get our data and kind of all the information that you need to know about our API and um, packages associated with it are gonna be in here. Um, I would say um, if you are a power user and you're interested in doing things beyond what our API is capable of, this is the place to go. If you are not, then um, it's a lot of information that you wouldn't necessarily need to look through. But if you are curious, we do have a whole section on it um, ready for you to check out. All right. Now that we've been through kind of all that great background information, we're actually going to get into looking for data products. So I'm going to go back within our data portal and I'm going to go to the Explore Data Products page. And this is where the magic happens. This is where you can look for and download our data products. So as you can see, we have these tiles right here. Um, all of these, these tiles are specific data products. Um, 
And on the left, we have filters. Um, so here you can see you can filter by our science team. And so we have airborne observation platform, which is our remote sensing data, aquatic instrument system, um, aquatic observation system, terrestrial instrument system, and terrestrial observation system. We have our different sites, states, domains, and even different themes. Um, so if you're curious about atmospheric data products, you can click that. And if you filter by this, you'll get a variety of different types of tiles, each tile being a specific data product. Something I want to point out before we actually look for a data product is this data product catalog right here. Um, so let's download it and check it out just so you guys can see what it is. Do, do, do while it's loading. So this is pretty much a snapshot of the metadata for every data product we have. Um, and so I'm going to go through it column by column. On the left, we have our data product ID. Every single data product we have has a very unique ID to it. Um, the first uh, three, the first two letters and number are the level number. So here we can see one, and that's a one here too. And that's an indication of how refined that data product is. So meaning some of our data products take a lot of um, refinement and working with to get it into a format that you guys can actually use. So a lot of our IS data doesn't need that, that instrument system data like wind speed, this top one. But most of our remote sensing data, we need to work with it a lot to get it in a format to where you guys can actually download it. So it will actually fit on your com computer and you can use it. And so we have to revise that data quite a bit and so, um, as you can see, this um, remote sensing uh, project um, spectrometer one from that airborne system is a level three, meaning we've refined that quite a bit more. Then we also have this um, five, digit five digit code. That's just a unique code for the data product. And then lastly, we have this kind of three digit code back here, the 001. Um, that is whether or not the data product has been majorly revised. I don't know of a data product that has been revised yet. I'm thinking that the um, pathogen data product might be soon for small mammals. Claire, can you speak on that at all? Yeah, uh, you, you have it exactly right. So we have, um, we have a data product revision that is imminent um, for the rodent pathogen data product. Um, Basically, we're, we're shifting from um, hantaviruses to uh, tick-borne diseases uh, in terms of uh, what we're looking for um, in those, those rodent blood samples. Um, and that's, that's kind of like the, the scale of change that would be a data product revision. So it's really, you know, the data from before and after the change are not really comparable. Like we're we're doing something different uh, in terms of, of exactly what we're targeting with those rodent pathogens, so um, or rodent-borne pathogens. Um, so the at least the plan is that making that kind of revision should be pretty infrequent. Um, so yeah. So right now you'll see all of those end in dot zero zero one. Soon there will be one that ends in a dot zero zero two, um, but you won't see a ton of those. Thanks for clarifying that, Claire. So that's what the data product ID means. Um, then next in this, we see level, which like I said, refers to that level number, um, the name of the product, whether or not it's available, the URL to that data product details page, the first month it was available. So some of our products have been available since 2013. So the latest month available, um, the science system it's under, and then a quick description of it. So this is just, like I said, a very quick snapshot of the metadata associated with our data products. Okay, so let's look for a data product. Um, I mentioned these filters earlier. I do think they're useful. However, personally, I think the search filter 
is going to get you to where you need to be quicker if you're looking for a specific data product. So today we're going to be working with photosynthetic active radiation, which is just essentially the amount of light available to plants for photosynthesis. So when you're thinking about it, it's going to be the highest in the summer and in the middle of the day when the sunlight is the most intense and the lowest to practically nothing at night um, and lower in the winter. So Photosynthetic active radiation is also known as PAR. Um, so I'm just going to search PAR and see what comes up. So it says 118 products from 81 sites. And that's because um, I'm searching for anything that has these letters in it. So we see lots of different data products coming up here. However, the one that we want is this first one, photosynthetically active radiation. Um, and we're going to go to that data products details page that I keep talking about. Um, so that's right here with the information sign next to it. I'm going to click on it. And it's going to load that page. If you are doing anything with one of our data products, I highly, highly recommend just looking through this page. It's going to give you all the information you're going to need to know about that data product, and it's going to make downloading and analyzing it so much simpler if you spend some time on this page. It has pretty much everything you need to know. It has that unique data product ID, a description and abstract. It tells you what science system it's part of. So because this is a sensor, um, it's part of our terrestrial instrument system. It tells you when it's been available. So um, we first started collecting data on this in 2013 and we're still collecting it. It even gives you a citation, so you can download and copy this citation and save it for later for when you publish, so you don't even have to worry about making that yourself. It goes over our collection and processing of this data product, um, so you can get a better idea of how we do that. Then we have this really great documentation system. I urge you guys to please spend some time with these documents for any data product you're using. That's because they go over really important quality information and methods information um, that will be useful to you for when you're analyzing the data. So here, because it's an instrument system data product, we talk about our algorithms and we really get into um, QA, QC and different quality flags. Um, but for uh, a lot of our observational system data, like that small mammal trapping one that I showed you earlier, we'll also include those protocol documents as our methods. Um, anyways, I really, really highly recommend you guys reading these. It will be really useful for you for when you start actually analyzing the data. And speaking of any issues or quality flags, we have this issue log table. Um, and so this is going to tell you about any issue that we might have had at any site for a sensor associated with, with photosynthetic active radiation. So if we click on this one, we can see that at this site, there was a fallen tree that destroyed the sensor mount um, and it affected the data for 80 days. So if you're noticing a gap in the data or some irregular data, you can see why and trace it back to this issue log. And you can see what exact site it was and the exact date. So this is really useful if you're trying to get a better picture of why your data might have quality flags on it. We're actually gonna skip this next availability and download section, but I just wanna point out that you can download the data from this page as well um, right here. So we're gonna skip this section and we're gonna get into this visualization section. So. I think these are so cool. Um, we have these time series visualizations um, for some of our instrument systems, as well as um, our airborne remote sensing system um, data products. And why they are cool is they give you a look at what this data looks like without having to go through downloading it and, um, and, and like working with it. Um, so you can get a taste of, you know, what am I actually looking at? So for photosynthetic active radiation, on the y-axis, we have micromoles per square meter per second, because that's what um, we're measuring it in. And on the x-axis, we have the date. And if we're looking at this, we see these peaks and valleys, which makes total sense with photosynthetic active radi radiation, because we have none at night, because it's nighttime, there's no sun. Um, and then we have the peaks during the day when the sun is at its highest. Um, 
So it's pretty cool to be able to actually view this data. Um, the other really cool thing about these um, visualizations is you can um, do a lot with them and filter them. So you can add sites. So let's add a site. Let's add Talladega National Forest in Alabama. And so that's versus our Abbey Road site, which is the blue one in Washington. And we can see that um, Talladega National Forest, that site has a lot more photosynthetic active radiation than our Abbey Road site, which would make sense because Abbey Road site's in the Pacific Northwest, probably more cloud clever. Um, whereas this one in Alabama probably definitely sees more sunlight. Um, you can also filter the date range. Um, you can also add quality flags. So let's see if any of this data had any quality flags. I just want to point out that there are so many different options with these with these visualizations, and I think they're really nice um, just to be able to see what the data looks like without even having to download it. So we're going to look at one more visualization before we actually start downloading data. So I'm going to go back to that Explore Data Products page, and I'm going to click this AOP data viewer. For those of you who are interested in AOP data, I think you're going to find these really, really cool and interesting. So um, we have a similar data viewer that we did for that time series um, instrument system data um, for our airborne remote sensing products. If you click AOP data viewer for um, this data product, the high resolution orthorectified camera imagery, um, going to take you to um, this page. And here, it's kind of hard to see if you're zoomed out, you know, what, what am I looking at? But if you zoom in, you can see you're looking at a landscape. And so this is from that um, remote sensing data. Um, it's images of the landscape and you can zoom in really far and it's super cool. And why this is neat is because AOP data takes a lot of space um, on your computer. It takes a lot to download and it's kind of complicated. So, be a, so being able to see the data just right now in real time is pretty great. Um, and I just want to point out that you can change your site. So here we're looking at um, that site um, in the Pacific Northwest, Abbey, but we can look at other sites. Let's take a look at Moab. And that's you know very different. It's a canyon site, um, a lot less vegetation. You can see the um, rivers running through it. Um, very neat. All right, let's check out that other um, AOP data viewer um, for vegetation industries from the spectrometer, because I think it is just super cool. And I saw that quite a few people were interested in our remote sensing data products. So vegetation indices, um, a lot of them are just asking, you know, how green um, is this site? So let's go back to Moab, because you think it's probably not super green. Doo -doo. And let's choose NDVI down here, because that is a measure of greenness. And wow, looks really cool. So we have, if we, if we zoom in, we can see we have these big dark spots, basically saying there's not a lot of vegetation in this spot. It's not very green. And we see these light spots all along the waterways, which would make sense. That's probably where the plant life can live in kind of a almost desert ecosystem in Moab. So anyways, I think these are super cool. They're really nice to be able to see the data without having to download it, especially for this remote sensing data because it's so big. Um, but let's go back to the Explore Data Products page. Okay, so remember earlier when I said um, the last 10 minutes of this is gonna be all of us working together to download this data product from this page, we are at that point. So, I would like you guys all to get to the data.neonscience.org data products page. Um, Claire, would you mind throwing that link in the chat so everyone can get there? And I'm gonna give you a minute to get there and stop talking. <laughs> um, and then we'll get started with downloading um, the data.
going to give everyone a few more seconds, just because this is a really important part. You need to do this step in order to participate in the next step. Just so make sure everyone can get to this Explore Data Products page. Okay, hopefully everyone has made it here. If not, um, Claire has likely put the link in the chat so you can get there. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is make our way over to this search bar. And I would like everyone here to search PAR, P-A-R. All right. Hopefully everyone has gone through that step. And we're gonna go to this first box. Um, don't worry about any of the other boxes, just this first one under sort. And we are gonna click download data. Um, so everyone see this blue box right here, click download data. All right, when you click it, you should be seeing this page that I'm sharing on my screen that says configure data for download. Um, and from this page, what you're gonna do is you're gonna select um, the sites and dates that you want to download data from. Um, and you're gonna see if you scroll down, this kind of big block of all these little gray and blue blocks. On the left, we have all of our field sites. On the top, um, we have the years that, they're, that the data is available from. A blue box means that that month during that year at that field site, we have data available. A gray box means that that data is not available, um, likely because either a quality issue um, or a, um, or the site just wasn't constructed yet. And what's kind of cool, um, speaking of construction, about this is that you can see the construction of the, of the observatory um, based on when data are available. So some of our sites started much earlier than other sites. So here, Seeper Central Plains Environmental Research Station in Colorado was one of our first sites. You can see that this data was available in 2014. But some of our other sites were not available. Um, they wasn't, weren't constructed as quickly. Um, BLDE, which is in Yellowstone. Um, and then our site in Hawaii wasn't constructed and ready um, and getting data available until 2019. So let's pick some sites. So I'm going to have you guys scroll all the way down. And we're going to pick wood and ref. So that, not yell, um, the second to last two sites, wood and wrapped, and I just want you to click on them. And your screen should look like this. It should be highlighted in blue for both of those sites. So now we have the sites we want. Wood is in um, North Dakota. Ref is in um, the Pacific Northwest. Um, so two very different sites. Um, now I'm gonna go up and select the dates we want. So right now you can see the estimated size, 2.43 um, gigabytes. This is a lot. And I don't think we need to do this many months of data. So we're all gonna scroll up here and look at this date range and choose three months, um, September, 2019 through November, 2019. So if everyone could click on this start and you're gonna go to this year right here above the month and select 2019, and then select OK. And it should say September 2019. Then we're going to click the end box, select, no, select the year. We want 2019. Then we're going to go to the month, click on May, and select November and hit OK. So I'm going to give everyone a few seconds to make sure that they have the correct dates and sites selected. You should have September 2019 in the start box, November 2019 in the end box, and you should have wood and ref selected. And something else I want to point out while others are making sure that they have those selected is that you can see the estimated size of what you're downloading right here. Um, so you know exactly how much you're going to be putting on your computer. All right, hopefully everyone has selected those. We're going to hit next. 
Okay, so now we come up with this question, do you want to include documentation? So these are all just relevant documents, um, most of which I pointed out to you um, on the data product details page that will be useful for you while you're analyzing the data. Um, so I'm gonna have you guys click include. Make sure that this um, has a blue circle under the include, and then we're gonna hit next. All right. Then we have a question, which package type do you want? Um, basic includes the data product, summary statistics, expanded uncertainty, and final quality flag. Expanded includes the basic package information, all of that, as well as um, quality metrics for all of the quality assessment and quality control analyses. So expanded gives you a lot of information about all the different quality flags. Um, we're gonna click expanded, um, so make sure you do that. All right. And then you see this page that says agree to policies. So in order to download our data, you should you need to agree if our data usage and citation policies, which I talked about earlier. But basically what you're agreeing to here is that you will cite our data um, when you use it. Um, so we're gonna click, yes, I agree to the NEON data usage and citation policies. And that's gonna take you to a summary page. Um, so we're gonna see what we're downloading the data product we're down the data product ID number, the sites and date range, the fact that we are including documentation, the package type. Make sure that these are all selected on your screen. Um, we also have some handy links over here to our file naming and conventions to help you understand when you download the data what those are. Um, and once again, we include that information on how to cite this data product right here, and you can copy it um, when you need to. But for now, we should just make sure that we have the two sites, September 2019 to November 2019. We're including documentation and that we're choosing the expanded package type. All right, if everybody's ready, we're just gonna click download data. And that ends my portion of um, this talk today. Um, so I think we'll give you another minute to make sure that you are caught up, that you've downloaded the correct data. And then we have some time for a few questions before we go on break. So what we're gonna do now is uh, actually start working with the data. Um, uh, again, if you, if you have questions while I'm talking, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and Marie will um, take a look at those. So um, I am gonna share my screen and uh, you will just be seeing my desktop. So before we uh, move into R, uh, first we're just gonna take a look at uh, that file of PAR data that we just downloaded. So you all should have uh, this neonpar.zip file uh, you don't need to follow along uh, for this part. Um, this is just going to be me uh, showing you what's in this zip file before we, we move into R to work with it. So if I unzip that and take a look at what is in that folder, uh, what you'll see is um, a bunch of uh, subfolders and then uh, a handful of PDF documents. So if you remember uh, when we were going through uh, the download steps on the data portal, uh, we checked the box for include documentation. So that's what these PDF files are. So these are um, all of you know, the documents that are available that are relevant to uh, the data product that we downloaded. So for the one that I just opened, this one is uh, explaining um, how uh, quality flags are applied to the instrumented data products. Um, so this is going to be uh, the same as that list of files uh, that was shown um, on the data product details page. Okay, so then we've got these uh, six subfolders. Uh, and if you look uh, at the, the names of those folders, um, they're going to match uh, what you see uh, if you looked at the file naming convention page, um, but some of it you can, you can kind of figure out just from looking at these. So you can see three of these subfolders say uh, wood for the Woodworth site, three of them uh, say ref for the Wind River site, 
then they have uh, the data product ID. Um, and you can see then there's actually a subfolder for each of those uh, three months that we downloaded. So September 2019, October 2019, and November 2019. So basically, we have a subfolder for each of the sites and each of the months that we downloaded. And if we look at what's inside one of those subfolders, there's a bunch of files. So I just opened uh, the 2019 uh, September file for Woodworth. There, um, you see a set of files that have this, uh, this one minute designation and a set of files that have a 30 minute designation. So uh, you're getting separate files for the one minute averages and the 30 minute averages. Um, uh, we'll get into this a little bit in a minute, but the reason that there's multiple sets of 30 minute and one minute files is because those are coming from different uh, sensors on different tower heights um, of the, the micrometeorological tower. Uh, and then these files here are um, uh, metadata files. So they, they provide a little bit of information about um, what's in these files here. And in the case of the sensor positions file, where each of those sensors is um, on the tower and, and on the globe. Um, but uh, as you can see, this is, this is not ideal, right? So we have, we have six subfolders and each of those subfolders contains files for one minute, 30 minutes and multiple tower heights. Uh, so that is a lot of files for just the two sites and the three months of data that we downloaded. So that is uh, exactly uh, the problem that we are going to solve uh, using the NEON utilities package in R. Uh, that package is going to take uh, this large number of files um, and merge them into something that's a little bit more convenient to work with. So, I'm gonna leave that and move to R. Okay, so um, at this point, if uh, everyone can follow along in our studio, that would be great. Uh, or R if you don't use our studio, although I, I imagine um, most of you will be using our studio. Uh, if you're if you're not familiar with uh, this environment, um, just briefly, we we type commands up here um, and either hit run or um, hit uh, command enter or control enter if you're on Windows, and then the commands will actually be run down here. Um, variables appear over here and um, uh, information like uh, plots and help files will appear over here. Okay, so uh, the first thing that we're going to do is uh, load the um, necessary packages that we need. Oh, sorry, meant to say what we're going to be doing at this point um, from here on, we are going to be um, following a specific tutorial. Uh, so that is linked here from um, the uh, workshop schedule, this link here, the download and explore neon data tutorial. So I'm going to be following uh, this tutorial uh, in what we're going to do next. Um, I am going to be doing it in a slightly different order than the way it appears in this tutorial. Uh, the tutorial is kind of laid out to download a bunch of stuff and then work through each of them. Uh, instead, I'm going to, you know, download one type of data, show you how to work with that type of data, and then move on uh, to the next. Um, the goal of this tutorial basically is just to give you enough familiarity to, you know, explore a specific data set within the uh, sensor data, the observational data, and the remote sensing data, and then just make a simple figure. So, you know, we're not going to be doing anything scientifically sophisticated here. The idea is just uh, to get familiar and to understand um, the, the tools that are available uh, to help you work with these data. Okay. So, coming back to um, loading packages. 
So first uh, we need neon utilities and then uh, the other package that we will need for this particular tutorial is the raster package. Uh, so neon utilities um, is uh, a package that was developed specifically for working with neon data uh, that has um, tools that are directly for neon data. Um, I, I am actually the maintainer of the neon utilities package. Um, the raster package, on the other hand, is, uh, you know, un unaffiliated with neon. It's just a package that's out there in the R community for working with R with raster data in general. Um, so uh, it's useful for working with neon remote sensing data because um, a lot of those data products are available as rasters, uh, but the raster package is not neon specific. Okay, so loading those two packages. Um, if you have any trouble uh, loading those packages, probably that indicates that there was something wrong with the installation. Um, and so uh, if you have any trouble with the installation, uh, you can try um, rerunning that um, with the install packages function. Okay. So what we're going to do first um, is just take that uh, par file that we all downloaded and uh, do that merge that I just described. So um, the way we're going to do that is using uh, a function called stack by table. Uh, which is in uh, the Neon Utilities package. Um, and so again, if you're not familiar or you haven't used RStudio a lot, this is a really handy thing uh, that RStudio will do for you. If you start typing, it will try to, you know, infer what you're, what you're headed toward um, and uh, try to fill in uh, what comes next. So if I type stack by, it says, hey, there's this function called stack by table that is in the package neon utilities. And then this little yellow box actually shows um, uh, the possible inputs that I might want to put into that function. Um, so this can be really helpful. Uh, it also has this nice feature called tab complete, which is at this point, if I have stack by and I hit the tab button, it will just finish that out. So basically by hitting the tab button, I'm saying, yes, Stack by table is what I want. You know, finish typing that for me. Uh, the only required input to stack by table is the file path to the location where you saved that file that we downloaded. Uh, so there, there are a few other inputs uh, that are options that we're not going to go into here because we are just going to put in a file path. Uh, so that goes in quotes. Um, this part is going to be uh, different because, um, or different for each of you, because what you need to type is just the file path to the location where you saved that file on your computer. Um, so in my case, um, I saved it on the desktop. Uh, I can actually use tab complete here as well. So uh, if I hit tab at this point, it will give me the list of files that are, you know, in the location that I've specified uh, so that then I can just select that uh, neon par dot zip. Um, so particularly those of you who are working on Windows, uh, file paths tend to look a little bit different on Windows. Um, you know, speak up in the chat uh, if you're having any trouble, but hopefully uh, you've all been able to construct that file path to the place where you save that zip file. So now I hit command enter and it starts thinking and it'll show this little progress bar while it does its thing. So it's trying to stack uh, a table of one minute data. There it goes. Still thinking. All right. Uh, so if you were watching, you saw that the 30 minute data went much faster than the one minute data. 
that makes sense because those data files um, are 30 times smaller. Um, so uh, we've got this sort of report that it stacked both tables and a little bit of information about um, what else it did and how long it took. So um, seems like everything was successful. Uh, hopefully that all worked on your machines as well. Um, and now uh, let's take a look at um, what I have on my desktop now, because, um, sorry, just coming back to R for a second. If you notice, my environment is still empty. I haven't actually brought anything into the R environment yet. Instead, I now have this neon par folder. It still has all of those documents. Um, so the documentation about the data product that we downloaded. But now instead of the subfolders that we had before, we just have this one stacked files folder. If we open that up, now instead of um, multiple files for different heights on the tower, we just have one file for the one minute data, one file for the 30 minute data, and then uh, the metadata files. Um, so let's take a quick look at that 30 minute file um, just to see what we have. Okay, so what we have here is uh, a file with, let's start with these two columns, uh, start time and end time. That is uh, the start and the end of the averaging interval. So the start and end of the, the half hour whose data have been averaged into each record. Uh, we have the data values. So starting here, par mean, par minimum, par maximum, variance, um, et cetera. If we scroll out to the right, we start to get to quality flags. Um, not a lot to see here because everything we can see has been passing its quality flags. Uh, so those, those zeros indicate um, that, you know, the quality flag uh, is acceptable, like the flag hasn't been raised. Um, and then the 100s indicate that 100% of the data that went into calculating this record um, passed their quality flag. Um, and then over here on the left, we have uh, the information that was in those file names before we did this stack by table step. So what we have here is uh, these data come from Woodworth and they come from vertical position 10 on the tower, which, which actually means one, it's the, the first tower position off of the ground. And if you scroll down, you can see, okay, here's the data from Wind River from uh, the seventh position off of the ground um, and so forth. So basically it took each of those individual files uh, that were, um, in that initial uh, package that we downloaded and just stacked them up vertically. So um, made one much longer file uh, out of all of them. Uh, if you wanna know more about, um, you know, you're looking at this and you go, okay, par mean, par minimum, that seems fairly obvious, but like, what, it, what is this, you know, par range fail? Um, there is uh, this file that starts with variables. Um, and let's take a look at that. So this file is where you can find the definitions uh, for each of those column headers uh, that are contained in the actual data file. Um, so here, you see, okay, par mean, arithmetic mean of photosynthetically active radiation uh, should be pretty clear. Um, and, you know, more information, uh, there's going to be uh, longer descriptions that are, that are um, a little bit, you know, less obvious for uh, these, these quality metrics um, and so forth. Uh, and you'll also see 
there are uh, a subset of these that are listed as having been appended by stack by table. So that's uh, these uh, site IDs and uh, tower positions um, that we, you know, merged together. Um, so, you know, just explaining what those are on the file. Uh, so the, this variables file is, um, it's a good place to go if you just want to know, okay, you know, what is the basic information about exactly what each of those data fields is that I've downloaded. All right, so let's go back to R. Um, I'm seeing in the chat uh, that a few people are having trouble um, with uh, the zip file um, or with the file path. Um, my, my sort of number one suggestion if you're having that problem is to try uh, using that tab complete um, that I showed uh, because that will, you know, keep you from entering any uh, um, typos, basically, because, you know, the, the tab does it for you. Uh, the other possibility, um, I'm seeing, I'm seeing someone saying that they have used this function before. Um, if there's any chance that you used it with an older version of Neon Utilities, you may need to update uh, the version of Neon Utilities on your computer. Um, we had uh, a pretty large release at the beginning of the year. Um, uh, sort of release of data and release of, of new functionality. Um, so uh, if you're trying to use this with um, any of the Neon Utilities versions that start with one, it's not going to work. Uh, you have to be using Neon Utilities version two or higher. Uh, we're, we're currently on version 2.1. Um, so, so give that, that reinstallation a try. Um, and let me know if that doesn't work. Okay. So what we're going to do now is take uh, that PAR file that we have just, you know, merged, but the, that is still um, in a local file, and we are going to read those data into R. Um, so uh, you could do that um, with, you know, any function in R that uh, that reads in tabular data. Um, but there is actually a function in the Neon Utilities package um, that takes advantage of the information in the variables file to um, do a couple of other steps for you. Uh, so um, basically, it's it takes this information and says, oh, hey, start date time and end date time are dates. Great, I will do the date conversion for you um, on ingest. Um, so that function uh, is called read table neon. Um, and it has uh, two inputs. Uh, one is uh, the file path to the specific data table that you want to ingest. And then the second input is uh, the file path to the variables file because it needs that variables file to do uh, the interpretation that it's going to do. So, uh, I'm going to go to, oops, Yampar. I'm going to go into the stacked files folder. And I'm going to choose the 30 minute data. So at this point, we're just going to read in the 30 minute data. And then the second input, uh, I can actually just copy and paste that line. And this time, select the variables file. So, ooh, and uh, now I need to be giving this a name. Um, so now, since we are actually reading something into the R environment, uh, we need to 
give it a variable name. So I'm calling it par 30 uh, because this is the 30 minute par table. So Okay, um, so uh, while everyone catches up with that, um, to be able to read in that file, um, let me see if I can figure out um, what the problem might be uh, with not being able to identify the file. Um, Folks who are having this problem, can you uh, type into the chat uh, the exact um, line of, of code that you entered into R? Um, so not just the error message, but um, what you typed in that resulted with that. Uh, oh, yes. So one person had trouble with um, the file path being too long. Uh, that is a major problem on Windows. You can't have a file path that's longer than 260 characters. Uh, so if that's the problem, then yes, move it to uh, somewhere that's going to have a shorter file path. Okay, so hopefully everyone now has this par 30 object read in. So now we can take a look um, at what we've got. So U par 30, and here we have the same thing um, that we just saw um, in uh, Excel. Uh, so we've just loaded that same thing. Um, you'll see if you if you look at both of those that uh, the start date time and end date time formatting um, looks slightly different, and that's because uh, that time conversion has been applied. Uh, when it was read into R. Okay, so what we can do now um, is make a little plot. Uh, so we can take those data that we just read in uh, and we're going to, uh, let's see, we are going to plot par mean as a function of start date time. And the data that we are going to use to do that is uh, the par 30 file, which we're going to subset to just uh, top of the tower. Um, so we want uh, vertical position equals 0, 8, 0. Um, make sure that that is actually how that got read in. Yes. Um, and we are going to make it a line plot type that correctly. Um, and I think my plot space is going to need a little bit more room. And hey, look at that. Uh, so this is basically a different version of um, the plot that we saw um, on that, uh, you know, data visualization tool on uh, the neon data portal, where, you know, sun comes up and sun goes down every day. Uh, and you you can actually see here as you move from, you know, September through November, uh, the days get shorter. Uh, and so, um, well, not so much the days getting shorter. You can't really see that on this plot, but, you know, the, the sun angle shifts. Um, and so uh, you get less uh, radiation each day. Um, so cool. Uh, basically, we've, we've demonstrated that you know, the data that we downloaded are in fact measuring radiation um, and we can, we can make a plot of them. Okay, so what we want to do now um, is move to uh, another data product. Uh, we're going to try um, an observational data product this time. Um, 
so from from a different data subsystem um, and uh, the way that we're going to download this next set of data um, is also going to get us away from these file path problems <laughs> um, so uh, what we did uh, to work with these par data was we basically did three steps uh, we downloaded the data from the data portal we used stack by table to merge the files and then we used read table neon to load those data into the R environment. Uh, so neon utilities uh, also has a function that can do all three of those steps at once um, or not at once, but you know, all in order with a single function call. Um, so it uses uh, the API to do the download and then it runs uh, the functions of stack by table and read table neon. So you only have to write one statement um, to read the data, to you know, get the data and read them into R. Uh, and so we are going to use that um, for uh, this next bit. So um, Uh, so the first thing before we get to the next data product, um, I think it's it's nice to sort of show what we would have done to get the data that we already worked with um, through this method. Uh, so um, I'm not actually going to run this line, but I'm, I'm going to type it out for you. So the function that we would use is called load by product. Uh, and you can see again here, that's in the Neon Utilities package. Uh, the inputs that we would need are the data product ID. Um, if you remember from when we were um, on the data portal, that data product ID is right here. So in this case, that's DP1.00024.001. So that is our first input. Uh, and then we need um, the same uh, criteria that we used on the data portal to subset uh, to the specific data that we want. So we need to specify the sites. Uh, so in this case, what we downloaded was uh, Woodworth and um, Woodward. I think I've been saying Woodworth and I think it's Woodward. Uh, and Wind River. And uh, we also need a start date, which in our case was 2019-09 and an end date, which is 2019-11. Uh, um, so that is what we would have needed to do to get the par data that we were just working with. Um, so if you're uh, if you're having trouble with the file paths, uh, give that a try. Um, but what I'm going to do actually is is move on to um, an observational data product so that we can start taking a look um, at what those look like uh, as opposed to the sensor data. So. What we are going to use as our uh, example um, uh, data product from the observational uh, data system is uh, aquatic plant chemistry. So, first thing that we need to do, uh, so we're going to call that AP Chem, and we're going to use the load by product function, the first thing we need is that data product ID. So if we go back to the data portal and filter, uh, instead of looking for par, we are now looking for aquatic plant chemical properties, uh, which conveniently is the first thing that shows up if I start typing aquatic. Um, and we can see right here, the data product ID 
for that is uh, DP1.20063.001. So that is what we're going to use here. And then uh, we're going to pick some sites. Um, so in this case, uh, we're going to download data from three sites. Uh, we're going to use uh, Prairie Lake, uh, Suggs, oops, Suggs, which is just Sug, uh, and Tulik, which is Took. Um, so that is, uh, I believe that those lakes are in Florida, somewhere in the upper Midwest for Prairie Lake, and uh, Alaska for Tulik Lake. Um, in this case, uh, we are actually not going to use, um, uh, thanks Marie, it's North Dakota, uh, that, where Prairie Lake is. Uh, in this case, we are actually not going to specify a start date and an end date. Uh, if you leave those empty in the, the load by product statement, um, it will just download the data for all time. Uh, I generally don't do that for sensor data. Uh, because the sensor data tend to be so large and that would involve downloading so much data. Uh, the observational data, uh, for the most part, um, are much smaller because of just sort of physical limitations. Uh, we just can't, you know, uh, humans are never going to be out there measuring things um, as frequently as a streaming sensor is. Uh, and so there's just not going to generate the same data volume. Um, we do specify uh, the data package, um, which made me realize I forgot to include that um, up here in terms of what we needed to uh, recreate what we did on the portal. We did need to specify the, the expanded package. Um, uh, if you don't include anything for the package, uh, load by product will default to the basic package. Um, so if you want the expanded package, uh, you want to specify that. So we should be good to go with that, having specified the data product, the sites, and the data package. OK, so here we see the first thing it does is it says, you know, I had to go find uh, the available files. And so it gave a progress bar for that. It did that fairly quickly. Um, and then just like the data portal, uh, it tells us how big uh, the download is going to be. Um, and again, going back to observational data being much smaller than sensor data, uh, this is less than two megabytes. Um, and so here to say, you know, do you, do you want to go ahead and download this? We just type Y for yes, and off we go. So we're going to get some more progress bars uh, while it tells us that it is downloading. And all right, so then it did the same uh, stacking step um, that it did with the portal data. Uh, it's just all those progress bars went by very quickly um, because uh, there isn't a ton of data. It didn't take a ton of um, memory to run through all of these. Uh, so here it's just you know reporting that it did all of these things successfully um, and you know, telling us at the end that it did everything very fast. OK, so hopefully that is working uh, on your computers. Um, it's likely that it's, it's probably um, likely to take a little bit longer um, on your machines than mine, uh, just because um, I am on the, the internal NEON network. Um, and that makes things a little bit faster. So uh, what we can see is uh, we now have this uh, AP Chem uh, object in our environment uh, that we downloaded. Um, and that object is actually a list. Um, so uh, if you remember from uh, what, we, what we got from the PAR data, if we look back at this, um, there are actually you know, five different tables here uh, of data and metadata. And so um, 
when load by product, you know, downloads, stacks, and loads all of that, uh, it includes all of those data and metadata files. And so those actually are in a named list. Um, so that's the object uh, that we've created. Um, so it actually has multiple data tables in it. And so you can see that if you just look at the names um, of that AP Chem object. Uh, so let's, let's start at the bottom of the list for those names. Um, we have a variables file, uh, just like we had for par data. Um, and then we have uh, a couple of other uh, metadata files. Uh, and then this first set of files that start with the, the APL underscore, those are the actual data files. Um, and so let's uh, take a look um, at one of those. So I'm typing down there and I want to type somewhere where it will be preserved. Um, so view AP Chem and let's take a look uh, at the external lab data per sample table. Okay, so, so before I get into uh, these details, um, let's just look back at this list of tables. So um, in the sensor data, in the PAR data, uh, we had two tables. One was at a one minute averaging interval and one was at a 30 minute averaging interval. And so um, that's, you know, fairly straightforward, right? It's, it's the same data, it's just been, you know, summarized to a different degree. Uh, it's a little bit different in the observational data products. So typically uh, for the observational data products, what you get is um, data tables that are associated with a particular um, like sampling activity or process. Um, so in this case, uh, you know, you would, if you were interested in working with this data product, uh, probably the first thing you would want to do is read the data product user guide that would walk you through, okay, here, here's what they do when they sample for aquatic, aquatic plant chemistry. You know, they, they harvest aquatic plants, they, you know, do some level of identification, they dry them, they send them out for analysis. Um, all of those are different activities, uh, and you can kind of see that in these table names that there's, there's a clip harvest, there's a biomass, and then there's, uh, the, you know, analysis, uh, at a lab, which is, which is where the chemical analysis is happening. Um, so you get in different information um, about the same protocol in different data tables. Um, and in some cases, you need to, uh, you know, bring those tables together, uh, do some table joins to get all of the information that you want all in one place. Um, and so that's what we're going to be walking through now. Um, so if we look at this uh, external lab data table, you see, okay, you know, similar to the sensor data, there's some information about the site where the sampling happened, the date when the sampling happened. Now there's, there's a sample ID um, that is, uh, you know, not too surprising. There's something to identify the physical sample that they collected. Uh, there's an indication of where the analysis happened, uh, you know, at what lab. Um, Okay, uh, scrolling over a little bit farther, there's some stuff that apparently wasn't relevant for these records. Um, and then we get to, okay, what was the analyte? Uh, you know, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and then what was uh, the actual value for that analyte? Um, so you can see, you know, this, this is kind of the, the heart of the matter. This is where you get the actual data for 
uh, the carbon and nitrogen content um, of these plants. Uh, and this, the rest of this information is, you know, you can, there's, there's always debates about, you know, exactly what is data versus metadata, but this is all information that you need to be able to interpret, you know, these carbon and nitrogen numbers. Um, and uh, again, like um, with the sensor data, uh, the variables file is going to be really useful um, in understanding this. So what you're going to see here in the variables file is um, you have information about the fields that are present in each of these tables. So you know, the biomass table has uh, information about um, samples, a chem subsample ID, a scientific name. Uh, the clip harvest has uh, a lot of geographic information, um, you know, benthic area, growth form. Uh, and so this, you know, again, to get the really thorough information, you would want to look at the user guide. But you can start to get a sense just from the variables um, of you know what's there in each table um, and what you're going to learn from each table. Okay, so uh, it can be um, a little bit annoying to work with uh, data as a named list and have to keep you know pulling everything from this uh, AP chem object. Um, I tend to work that way myself and just keep everything in the list. Um, but there is also um, a handy function called uh, list to env, which is basically a uh, list to environment, um, where we can take the AP chem object and just uh, write everything in it out to the global environment. So if we do that, you can see over here, now uh, we have individual objects in the environment for each of those data tables uh, from the AP Chem object. Um, so that can make things a little bit easier to work with. So what we're gonna do now uh, is just take a look um, at uh, some of the numbers from uh, the chemical analyses uh, of these plants. So let's see, I have been slacking off on writing comments, explaining what we're doing. Um, so uh, we're going to make a box box plot of analyte concentration, uh, which we saw over here is where uh, the actual data live. Um, and let's just take a look at analyte concentration as a function of site ID. Um, and the data in this case are uh, the APL plant external lab data per sample. Um, and we are going to look just at a specific analyte. So we're going to subset set to those data where the analyte is uh, D13C. So this is where we're looking at um, the stable isotope ratio um, of carbon-13 uh, in aquatic plants across these three sites. I will just um, put some friendly access labels on there so we know what we're looking at. OK, and so here we see uh, the range of um, 13C isotope ratio ratios um, across those three sites. And we can see that, uh, you know, Suggs and Tulik are 
fairly similar, a little bit more of a spread um, at Tulip. And Prairie Lake is, uh, you know, a little bit more um, enriched in 13C relative to the other two lakes. Um, so that's interesting. Um, and uh, probably uh, the very next thing that you're thinking is, okay, you know, odds are good that that is uh, related to what species are found there. Um, you know, these, these kinds of isotope ratio numbers are, you know, sort of loosely associated with, with what you would expect from uh, C3 and C4 plants. It's a little bit different in aquatic systems, but, you know, sort of as a starting hypothesis. So, okay, let's, let's look at what species. Uh, but if you remember from looking at the variables file, uh, if you look at what we have in the uh, external lab data per sample table, um, we don't actually have um, a species identification uh, in that table. Uh, the species identification, uh, which is this scientific name field, um, that is in this biomass table. Uh, and so in order to see uh, what the distribution of uh, carbon isotope ratios looks like across species, we're going to have to do a join uh, between those two tables uh, to bring that information together. So um, just write a quick note. Um, All right, so we're going to define uh, a new object, um, APCT, and that object is going to be created by a merge um, between APL biomass and APL plant external lab data per sample. Uh, so then we have to uh, tell the merge function which columns of data to use uh, to do the merge. Um, so if you go back to the variables file, um, you'll see there's this sample ID in APL biomass, and there is also a sample ID in the plant external lab data. Um, it is, you know, probably cheating a little bit for me to tell you that that is definitely the right uh, column to merge on. Um, in general, if you're sort of, you know, working with a new and unfamiliar observational data set and you, you know, see that there's data in two different tables that you need to bring together, uh, again, the data product user guide is going to be um, your best guide to figuring out what is the, the appropriate uh, joining variable. Uh, there's a section uh, in each data product user guide called data relationships that walks through, um, you know, what the, the sort of the joining variables, the, the key variables um, are in each of the tables. Um, so we're going to join on sample ID. Uh, we are also going to include uh, name, location, domain ID, and site ID. Um, those are not actually necessary for the join. Uh, they're they're going to be redundant with sample ID. I just like to include them in the join because um, that keeps us from ending up with duplicates of those columns. Basically, if you don't include them in this statement here, you end up with copies uh, where, you know, one is from each table because each table brings in uh, a domain ID and a site ID and a name location. Um, so that that can just be a nice thing to do when when you know that there's information that's identical in both tables. So. All right. We run that merge. Um, something else that uh, 
I always find really useful when I do a merge is just to take a look at this um, little environment area over here to make sure uh, that nothing looks too crazy. So if you look at this, you can see, okay, the, the plant external lab data per sample had uh, 458 rows in that table. The biomass table had 218 rows. And now our merge table uh, has 438 rows. So um, that is not like definitive that everything is fine. But usually if you if you do a merge and something goes terribly wrong, uh, usually what happens is either you end up with zero rows because it just something blew up, or you end up with um, a totally un unrealistic number of rows, like the, the, you know, whatever you would get from 218 times 458. Uh, that's sort of the, the other most common way that merges um, go is uh, it just duplicates everything and you end up with um, a row for every combination uh, of possible rows. So that didn't happen here. That's a good sign. Um, so now uh, we should be able to uh, plot um, 13C uh, as a function of, um, of species, because now we have them both um, in the same table. So I'm going to make a box plot again um, of analyte concentration. So that has not changed, but now we are doing it as a function of scientific name. Um, data is uh, that new APCT uh, object, that merged table that we created. And we still need to do the same subsetting to uh, analyte equals D13C. Um, and I'm going to make the Y axis label. Uh, let's see what that looks like. Okay. So, um, just because of the size, uh, R is omitting a number of the species names. Um, let's see. All right, if I use the modifications that are in the tutorial, that should help. Um, so this is just modifying the figure a little bit to change the direction of the names and make them smaller. Um, so that we can actually see what each of these are. Sorry, now I've covered up the code. Okay, so we can see that this is, you know, basically uh, what we expected um, and what my sort of off the cuff hypothesis was that uh, the, the plants that are relatively depleted in 13C are, you know, just a couple of species and the rest of the species are, you know, down here, more depleted, like we would expect from uh, your average C3 plant. Okay, so that is um, kind of the basics of how to um, use the, the stacking functions in Neon Utilities. Um, the downloading um, and sort of ba very basic uh, navigation of um, sensor data and observational data. So um, the next thing we're going to move on to um, 
how to use Neon Utilities to uh, download remote sensing data. So before um, I go to that, um, are there any questions about what we did so far? Um, you know, how, how Neon Utilities worked? Um, any, uh, anybody having problems with the code um, that, that we haven't been able to address in the chat? Okay, cool. Um, so let's try uh, downloading some remote sensing data. So uh, so to do this, um, there are two functions in Neon Utilities. Um, they are uh, by file AOP and uh, by tile AOP. Um, so this, um, and I should say, uh, don't run those. <laughs> I mean, nothing bad will happen if you do. It's just uh, nothing will happen at all. They won't work pr properly with no inputs. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the distinction between those two um, and, and why they both exist. Um, so by file AOP uh, will let you download um, everything for a given data product site and year uh, from the remote sensing. Um, so, you know, that's useful if you want, say, you know, all of the NDVI data, all of the camera imagery um, for a given site uh, for a different, for a given um, flight event. Um, but like we've talked about several times, that can be a ton of data, um, just like a really huge amount. <laughs> um, and so uh, you don't always want to do that. Um, so uh, we were, it came up in the chat earlier um, there are uh, remote sensing data products that are mosaic and then broken into tiles. Um, so uh, each tile uh, for all of those products is one kilometer by one kilometer, um, which means that, you know, one tile is, is not an overwhelming amount of data. Um, and so uh, the by tile AOP function is there so that if if you only need the data, you know, that are um, that are associated with, you know, one tile or a handful of tiles, um, this function gives you a way to just download those. Um, and actually, if you go through uh, the download steps for um, AOP data on the data portal, uh, it has that capability as well to let you download just some um, of, of the data that, uh, or, you know, just some of the data that's available for a given uh, site and a given flight event. Um, so this is especially useful uh, if, you know, say you are using um, neon data that were collected on the ground and you want to connect those uh, data to the overflight. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the neon tower is just, you know, one little spot um, in a site. And so, you know, maybe you just want the tile where that, where the tower is. Um, or, you know, maybe you just want the flux footprint, you know, at most that's going to be a couple of tiles. Maybe you want um, everywhere where, um, uh, where vegetation was sampled, that's, I mean, I, I'm guessing a little bit, but probably the maximum would be like a dozen tiles. Um, whereas the, the full flight box is usually about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. Um, so you can really cut down the, the amount of data that you have to download if you just focus on the tiles that you want. Um, and uh, 
I don't know, we might talk about that a little bit tomorrow when we talk about um, working with geolocation data. Um, and then uh, they are definitely going to talk about that in uh, the LIDAR breakout session, um, because that breakout session includes uh, tying the LIDAR data to um, tree measurements on the ground. Um, so that is going to include, um, and the, the tutorial for that, for those of you who aren't attending that breakout session, can walk you through how to connect those, that ground sampling to um, the tiles from the remote sensing data. Okay, but what we're going to do here um, is uh, we are just going to download um, a single tile that is predetermined in this tutorial. Um, so uh, we're going to use by tile AOP um, to to download a tile that you know we just came up with when we wrote the tutorial. Okay, so same as uh, load by product, the first input that we need to put in to by tile AOP is um, the data product ID. Uh, in this case, um, what we are going to download is um, the uh, ecosystem structure data product, which uh, contains the canopy height model. Um, so this is um, So this is an estimate of uh, the height of the top of the canopy um, that is calculated from the LIDAR data. Uh, and so we see here its data product ID is DP3.30015.001. So that is what we're going to need as an input. Um, and then we need the site. Uh, we are going to use Wind River Experimental Forest again. Uh, one thing to know about um, by tile AOP is so this is different from uh, load by product in that you can't put in multiple sites. Um, for the remote sensing downloads, uh, you can only handle one site at a time. Um, uh, instead of using a start and end date, uh, we just put in a year. Uh, we are going to download 2017. Um, and then to specify the tile, you put in an easting and a northing. So in this case, easting is 580,000. Northing is 507500. Um, and then uh, in this case, so we are um, downloading, but we are not reading directly into R in this case. Uh, so we need to put in an input of where do we want this tile that we're downloading to be saved to. Um, and so that input um, is the save path. Um, in my case, uh, I am just going to save this uh, to my desktop the same way that I did uh, with the PAR data. Um, so uh, apologies that we are, we are back in the land where um, file path challenges um, are a possibility. Um, so uh, put in a file path that's going to work for you. Uh, for those of you on Windows, um, just a warning that um, the way that these data are saved, uh, there's a very specific nested structure to the folders uh, that gets pretty long. So if you can save this uh, somewhere fairly close to the root directory, um, that is definitely going to help you out. So, okay. So just like load by product, this tells me, okay, I'm going to download six files. Uh, they're going to be about four megabytes. Do I want to go ahead with that? Yes. And here it goes downloading. Um, and so uh, in this case, the output that you get from this function, it actually tells you 
uh, the exact file path to where it saved um, each of the files that it downloaded. Uh, and if we go and look at that, so here it's created a folder uh, with the name of that's just named by the data product ID. If we open that up, um, this is where you'll see uh, what I was just talking about in terms of um, the very nested file structure. Uh, there's a folder for the year, full site, domain, uh, and then level, discrete LIDAR, canopy height model, and we finally get to this TIFF file. Um, so it's it's pretty deeply nested, and you can you know also see that from the file path here. Uh, someone is getting an error that no tiles were found. Yeah, my my best guess is a typo, um, especially with all those zeros. I I get it wrong pretty often. Um, so let me know if that doesn't work. Um, okay. So at this point, um, we are actually going to, uh, if you remember from back at the beginning, uh, when we loaded packages, uh, we loaded Neon Utilities, but we also loaded the raster package. So at this point, uh, we are actually going to move to using that raster package. Um, so using a package that isn't specifically designed for Neon data, but just for uh, raster data in general. Um, and that is what we're going to use to um, uh, load this remote sensing data into R. So um, uh, we are going to name this object CHM for canopy height model. Um, and uh, there is a function in the raster package that is also called raster. That's what we're going to use. Um, that is the function that can uh, load the tile into R. And so now what we need to type into that raster function is that uh, extremely long um, file path. So uh, a couple of options. Um, you can try uh, just copying and pasting um, this message from uh, the function output, where the function, you know, told you where it saved the file. Um, you can also uh, use the tab complete. So if I go to my desktop, and then to the data product, basically, I can just keep hitting tab and enter to get through all of these folders. Uh, when I get to here where I actually have a choice, I want the, uh, the L3 folder, discrete LIDAR. This is going to spill off the page. I want the canopy height model TIFF. And finally, one last uh, entry, I finally get to the .tiff file. Um, so uh, that can be an indicator uh, in terms of you know, whether you're getting the file path right. If you don't eventually end up somewhere with the dot .tiff, uh, then you have not found it. OK, uh, folks getting lost in the chat. So um, basically, what we're doing here is just uh, getting the file path to that um, TIFF file that we downloaded, that single tile. Um, so I just did that with the tab complete. Um, I can do the same thing. Um, and hopefully this option uh, might be a little bit easier. Uh, I can come here and say, I'm just going to copy and paste because uh, by tile AOP, um, one of the outputs that it just, you know, returns into the console is the, the location where it saved everything. So I should be able, 
to just copy and paste that file path um, into uh, where I need it. So I copied that, I paste it, uh, and that will get me to, you know, one step short of the .tiff file. So at that point, if I put a slash and then a tab, I should get back to the same file path. Um, okay, could not find function raster. So that um, means that the raster package uh, didn't load correctly. Um, so try, uh, try running uh, install packages raster again, and then library raster. Um, and if either of those has an error, then we'll have to look at those. Um, let me just run that. Um, okay, sorry, that uh, is actually just complaining about my little graphics window here. Um, those those warning messages uh, are not actually about the raster function um, that you're seeing on my screen. Uh, someone else is getting an error message uh, that they can't create a raster layer object from this file. Probably that means that there's something wrong with the file path. Um, at least that's that's the most likely scenario. Um, so give the file path another try. Um, Okay, but if if you have been able to uh, read in and create this CHM object, um, we should now um, be able to make a little plot of uh, canopy height um, in this tile. Um, and that actually all we need to do is type plot CHM um, and the raster package will take care of the rest of it for us. So there we go. Uh, so what we have here is uh, an image of this particular tile where the color uh, is an indication of the canopy height. Um, so the greens are the tallest trees, and these, you know, pale pinks are the shortest trees. Uh, we're at uh, Wind River in um, Southwest Washington State, uh, so you know the tallest trees are over 60 meters. Um, but there's also, you know, some sort of uh, clear cut that you can see in this image where um, the trees are really short. Uh, so. You know, I, I like this one as an example um, because uh, at an awful lot of sites and an awful lot of places, if you look at the canopy height model, it's just kind of, you know, hey, there's a closed canopy and it's, you know, about 20 meters tall. It's not that exciting, um, but there's actually, you know, some variety here um, with some, some very tall trees and some very short trees. Okay, so with our, with our last few minutes, um, I want to show you uh, a few tutorials that we're, that we're not going to all go over together, but that um, are sort of useful uh, next steps that you might take or, you know, different directions that you might take after um, this download and explore tutorial. So um, if we go to go to the tutorials page. Uh, the first thing I want to show you is um, the API token tutorial. So uh, this is, um, like I mentioned, the, uh, the download functions in Neon Utilities uh, are accessing data from uh, the Neon API. Um, there is uh, an option in the API to include um, a token, which is basically just, it's, it's like an identifier associated with your user account that says, you know, this is the person who is accessing stuff from the API. Um, 
it's obviously not mandatory. Everything that we just did, we did without tokens. Um, but uh, it is it is useful to us on the neon end, and it is useful to you uh, to do this. So it's it's useful on the neon end because uh, it lets us get a better um, a better sense of how many users we have um, to have their downloads associated with tokens. Uh, it gives us more information about, you know, hey, this specific user, you know, downloaded these six data products together. Like, is is there, you know, sort of a, a unity among those data products that's important for us to know about? All, all kinds of things um, that we can learn from having uh, that information about who's downloading what. Um, and then it's useful on your end um, because it will make your downloads go faster. Uh, so the way that the API works, um, there is uh, a rate limit um, on uh, accessing the API. Uh, that is basically, um, uh, if you're if you're familiar with uh, in the in the tech industry, um, they occasionally run into things called denial of service attacks, um, basically where uh, malicious hackers set up something to like keep making requests over and over again and, and like totally disable um, the you know whatever the service is. Uh, we were running into situations where people were trying to download like all of the remote sensing data. And it was basically like they were accidentally perpetrating a denial of service attack on Neon. Um, so the rate limit stops that from happening um, because it, you know, it th throttles the, the number of requests that can be made at once. Um, and if you have a token, you get a higher rate limit. Um, so that will, that will make your downloads faster. Um, so uh, check this out. If, this tutorial out if you um, are are up for doing that. And basically, uh, all that it changes, if, if you set up a token, all that really changes is um, if you are, say, running load by product, then you add another input for token equals blah. Um, the, the tutorial explains, because the, the token is extremely long, the tutorial explains uh, some methods for like saving that token in some place um, accessible so that then you can just pull it up every time you run the function uh, without having to type in this super long thing. Um, okay, so that um, is one useful tutorial that I wanted to point out. Uh, another one is, um, we do have a tutorial for uh, using the Neon Utilities package from Python. Uh, so if you are, you know, a dedicated Python user who is just putting up with R uh, for this workshop, um, this is a good option. So uh, there's this package in Python called RPy2 that lets you um, basically create an R environment within Python. Uh, and so um, this tutorial walks you through using that environment within Python, like just as much as you need to access the data, and then reading the data into Python uh, directly so that, you know, then from there you can proceed to do whatever you want to do in Python um, and, and only use um, Neon Utilities for um, the, the specific features that only Neon Utilities has. Um, and then uh, finally, I know um, you know people have have already signed up for the breakout sessions. Um, so for those of you who are signed up for um, the API breakout, uh, we are going to get into sort of the the back end details of okay, you know, Neon Utilities uses the API to do these things. Like what it, what is it actually doing, and what what does it look like? to access the API directly um, instead of you know, using something like Neon Utilities as an intermediary. Um, so uh, even if you're not signed up for that breakout session, uh, this tutorial is available uh, if you're interested in that sort of more 
nitty gritty getting getting at the guts um, of what's happening in the API. Uh, and that tutorial is um, it's based in R, but a lot of a lot of what matters um, in terms of how you use the Neon API is just uh, constructing the API calls, which um, like that's that's applicable to any language. Um, and so there, there's a lot in this tutorial um, that I think is is relevant even if you're not working in R. Um, R just happens to be the the space where it's being applied in this tutorial. 